If you're listening to this podcast, it's probably because a child you love and care for is differently wired. Are they also struggling in their current educational setting, seen only for what they're doing wrong while longing for positive relationships with peers and others? Envision a world where your child's unique abilities are not just recognized, but celebrated. A world where they can connect with others and their true potential is seen and appreciated. The Strength-Based Assessment Lab's mission is to build a world for your child just like that. Through its innovative approach, it aims to empower students, families, educators, and professionals to create positive, effective, and collaborative learning experiences. Be a part of shaping a brighter future for your child. Visit www.bgs.edu to learn more about what a strength-based assessment could mean for your family. That's bgs.edu. Being able to separate our own emotional needs and baggage, so to speak, from our child's needs and behaviors allows us to respond to them much more productively and effectively. So overall, as parents, we'll be able to guide our child with their own self-regulation much more effectively if we ourselves have done the work first. Welcome to Tilt Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and this week, my guest is Angela Pruess, a licensed clinical therapist and mom of three who wants to help all of us raise emotionally healthy kids that will change the world by explaining the heart and science behind our child's development and emotional needs. Angela is the woman behind Parents with Confidence, and she frequently writes about childhood mental health and the therapeutic power of play. Angela and I have been in touch since I first launched Tilt, so I'm really excited to finally be bringing her onto the show. She has a lot of areas of expertise, but for this episode, we decided to specifically focus on the topic of that elusive thing so many of us are trying to help develop in our kids, but can be very difficult to know how to do and what we should expect over a child's developmental timeline. I'm talking about self-regulation and emotional regulation. Today, we'll dive deep into what these types of regulation are, why they're an important skill for our kids to develop, the different ways we as parents and caregivers and teachers can support our kids and nurture these skills, and much more. There are a lot of great nuggets in this episode. I hope you get a lot out of it. Hey, Angela, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Debbie. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, you know, I was realizing I was going back through our correspondence and I realized we talked pretty early on, I think, when I launched Tilt and uh, just trying to figure out how to get you on because you have expertise in so many areas that we cover. And I, I'm excited about the topic that we came up with today and talking about emotional regulation, self-regulation. But before we get into that, please just take a minute and tell us about who you are and, and what you do and kind of your personal why. Sure. So my journey kind of started around 15 years ago when I started working as a child and family therapist with differently wired kids. Um, and I always loved seeing the world through their unique perspective and seeing how these kids would find strength and resiliency in the face of adversity. And then about eight years ago, I had a little collision of work and life when we had um, our oldest daughter and I got to start walking this path of raising a unique, differently wired kiddo. Um, So our oldest daughter, who's eight now, has ADHD and attentive type. And our six-year-old is 2E, so she has ADHD combined type and is also gifted. And she also um, deals with anxiety and sensory processing challenges. So I really got to see how the experience of raising a unique kiddo could be so isolating and how there was so much space for more information, more awareness, more support around you know, really hard issues that parents face when their kiddos are dealing with mental health challenges, like, you know, aggressive kids in the classroom or the decision of whether or not um, to start medication. There were just so many things that I felt like, you know, parents just needed more support with. So I was inspired to start my website, which is Parents with Confidence, as a way to reach more parents who are struggling in this path, on this path, in hopes of helping them to 
find confidence in the role of parenting a more complex kid and to also provide information to parents with my background um, as a counselor that allows their child to grow to their full potential because I so deeply believe that every child deserves to reach their full potential and although it'll certainly be a more complicated path um, to get them there, it is so worth it to unfold what these amazing outside-the-box kids bring to the world with their awesome, unique gifts and viewpoint. So that's, yeah, where I'm at today. That's so interesting. You know, very few people I talk to who are doing the work of supporting differently wired kids got into this work before their children were born. And then, you know, one would assume that you're just, you know, you have these kids and you're like, awesome, I've got all the tools, no problem. Has has it been like that for you? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started, Debbie, with that. Um, <laughs> yes, right? I mean, on some on some level, maybe we all are under that illusion that we are prepared and know what's coming. And um, yeah, so probably to a greater extent, I was theoretically prepared and thought I knew what was coming. And holy cow, no, my kids were ready to grow me more than I was even prepared for at the time at all. So, so yeah, it's been the best, you know, inspiration for self growth on my end. And I think that the experience has certainly helped, you know, me and my clinical work. Um, and I think honestly has made me a, a pretty good parent too, or certainly a different parent than I would have been for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, I, you know, I used to write books for teens and I had done a series for Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul. I was working on it when Asher was born and I just remember thinking, boy, man, when the teen years come, I am going to be so set. Like I know teens inside <laughs> and out and I'm just going to rock that. And it's, uh, that's really not happening. I'm just going to say that is not what's happening in my house right now. And I tried to, I tried to pass those books on to him. He was, could not have been less interested in those books. So I'm like, okay, just going to forget what I thought I knew and start from scratch here. But anyway, so I want to shift the conversation to talking about this idea of regulation. And, you know, this is something we really haven't done an episode about this. And I remember when I first even learned the words emotional regulation or dysregulation. And, you know, those became part of what therapists were talking to my husband and I about. And we knew it was important for Asher, but it was so new to me, you know, even the concept of it. So can you, as a way to set us up for this, explain what emotional or self-regulation is? Yes, certainly. So yeah, self-regulation is a big, broad topic. So for the purposes of our chat today, we'll hone in on the emotional and behavioral aspects of self-regulation. So really, self-regulation is the ability to manage your emotions and behavior in accordance with the demands of a situation. So it's how our kiddos are able to inhibit their emotional or behavioral responses and is a set of skills that allows them to direct their behavior or inhibit their impulses toward a goal. So making it till the end of the birthday party to in order to get cake would be a small example. So research consistently shows that self-regulation is necessary for social, emotional, and academic success and overall well-being and is one of the most, if not you know, the most important skill for our child to develop in the early years. And Thankfully, um, you know, we humans have neuroplasticity, so we're adaptable, our nervous systems are adaptable, and we're able to improve our emotional self-regulation over time. So this is a good promising thing for, for parents of differently wired kiddos. Um, so with age and time, that self-regulation will naturally unfold, even if many of our kids are delayed several years in that area. And much of self-regulation is hardwired and part of our temperament. So kids with neurodevelopmental conditions like ADHD and anxiety will inherently struggle with self-regulation uh, because their autonomic nervous systems are triggered too often um, due to anxiety, sensory processing issues, all of those types of things. So I'm sure I wouldn't be 
saying anything surprising to parents listening when talked about signs of struggle with self-regulation. So meltdowns, out of control behaviors, impulsivity, and physical and verbal aggression are all different symptoms and different things you would see in a kiddo that is struggling with emotional self-regulation. Well, I want to talk about the ages and, and what to expect, because I will say that, you know, this was a huge issue for us when Asher was younger, because obviously this is where emotional dysregulation creates a ton of problems in school. And he was a child who really got dysregulated a lot in school, especially, I mean, at home, sure, but at school, it's so disruptive. And I just remember thinking, how is this little human ever going to get to a point where he could catch himself and notice this is what's happening and make a different choice? I was like, most adults I know don't know how to do that. And it seemed like such a long road to me. And I will say we're not at the other end of it completely either. Um, but it seemed so daunting. Like, is this really possible for a little differently wired human to be able to develop these skills? So I'm wondering if you can tell us what it looks like, like how young can kids actually start to work on these? And and maybe I don't know if you have an example of someone you've worked with or but just kind of what what we could expect it to look like at different ages. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think, I think it is going to be so different for kids that are neurotypical and kids that are differently wired because of the clear delays there will be in these areas. But, you know, generally they say that you can expect kiddos to start really internalizing some of these things and start to see some of the shifts in self-regulation around kind of the late preschool years, early elementary years. So, you know, you start seeing those things unfolding and, you know, with every year and every, with each year brings more growth of our prefrontal cortex and more ability to, to use our executive functions and use and hone and develop all of those skills that go into self-regulation. Um, and with our kiddos, having the expectation that it really is going to be a much longer, much slower learning curve um, is only going to help parents because, you know, as far as an example goes, it's been very interesting to see in our own family, you know, two kiddos who are differently wired and our youngest, who is now three, um, is neurotypical and he, in many instances, Debbie can regulate himself better than his older sisters. Um, it quite honestly kind of blows my husband and I away because you can just see it. You know, you can just see these inherent challenges that our girls have, you know, in any, in any situation, you know, they're moving through, through their day and just have to overcome so many more challenges when it comes to regulating their emotions and impulse control and all of these things. So really, you know, we still need to closely support them with their, and we'll talk a little bit more about this kind of the concept of co-regulation, but we really closely support them with their big feelings and help them navigate through regulating themselves. Whereas it takes much less to guide and help our three-year-old navigate those things. He is really able with minimal redirection and minimal support, he's able to kind of get back on the right track without getting so emotionally heightened. So, you know, the feelings don't get quite as intense and then they also subside quicker as well. So he, he's really able to transition in and out of emotions much easier. And we're really um, giving our, our girls quite a bit of support. And I think the general guideline, at least I know off the top of my head for ADHD is about, you know, a three to four year developmental delay when it comes to some of these skills. And every kid is so different. And, you know, then we factor in all the other developmental stages and, you know, the brain growth that just typically happens along the path of development. And, and every kiddo is so different. So it's hard to say, but I think overall, really having the expectation that it is going to be a long path and that one that, you know, you will be very involved in and that your child will eventually get there. But 
it will take time. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back after this quick break. Darren and I are prepping for a big move at the moment. So we are fully leaning into any and everything that simplifies things. And that absolutely includes mealtimes. At a time when my executive functioning skills are being pushed to the limit, even planning and executing dinner for our family these days can feel like a really big lift. That's why I'm especially grateful for Green Chef, a meal service that offers pre-measured and prepped ingredients to my door. Each box is packed with foods you can feel good about, like whole fruits and vegetables, plus lean protein and whole grain options. In fact, one of the things I love most about Green Chef is that they offer options that prioritize gut and brain health, with science-backed recipes that feature ingredients like fiber, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids. During this time of lots of stress, it feels really grounding to know we're supporting ourselves nutritionally. I will take all the support I can get. And Green Chef doesn't just cover dinner recipes. I can add high quality breakfasts, lunches, and snacks to my weekly box from Green Market. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash tilt50 and use code tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code tilt50 at greenchef.com slash tilt50. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. Well, even just hearing that is so helpful that your child will eventually get there because I think especially when our child is exhibiting pretty big behavior and, you know, we're not knowing how to handle it. it, And it seems like it's taking a long time, you know, uh, and lots of consistent messaging and things like that. Um, It does often feel like this is never going to happen. Like this is just the way. And then, you know, we start spiraling and thinking about what's this going to look like in college? What's this going to look like at a job. So it's just even hearing you say that they they will get there. It's just on a delayed timeline is feels really good actually. It feels comforting and and optimistic and I like that. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, you know, I imagine this is an issue for many parents listening right now with their kids. And so where do you recommend that parents start in terms of Get, you know, supporting our kids in developing their self-regulation strategies or abilities? Yeah. So square one, if we want to see our child improve regulation of their emotions and behaviors is actually what's modeled for them in their environment. So I often catch parents off guard with this one. And, you know, usually our first instinct is to try to look to the child, right? We Our instinct is to control and manage as humans, I think, and as parents and culturally. So, you know, when in fact, you know, we're looking, looking to our child and what can we change about them and how can we fix them, so to speak, when, you know, the reality is, is that us as parents are often not modeling great self-regulatory behaviors. So what does this mean? Um, Really that, you know, parents need to do the hard work of discovering their own triggers and how to work through them productively, 
our kids are just so typically very sensitive and really in tune with um, our energy, with their parents' emotions. So having and presenting a calm and steady presence really is going to help immensely to lower the child's anxiety during their emotional storms um, as they see that their parent is a steady emotional presence available to them. So a great place to start is, you know, looking at, you know, what really bugs us, what triggers us the most um, with our child's behaviors and reflecting on, you know, why that is, you know, what about me and the way that I am and the way that I'm wired um, or the way that I was raised, my background, what all goes into that and why is this taking me to a heightened place emotionally and then how am I reacting to that? Is it in a helpful way? Is it in a productive way? Um, that's teaching my child, you know, what I want to see in them uh, or not. So because this is not a case of, you know, do as I say and not as I do. I mean, we really have to, which I think you probably know, you know, these kids push us to to manifest the the things, the concepts, the things that we're trying to teach them and the the behaviors and things that we'd like to see in them. They're saying, you know, that's not going to fly. You know, you, we need to live this and I need to see you doing this and they'll call you out, you know, on your hypocrisy in a hot second if, if you're not practicing what you preach. So, you know, this is where a lot of mindset shifting can come in when parenting a differently wired kiddo, because being able to separate our own emotional needs and baggage, so to speak, from our child's needs and behaviors allows us to respond to them much more productively and effectively. So overall, as parents, we'll be able to guide our child with their own self- self-regulation much more effectively if we ourselves have done the work first, basically. Yeah, I will say that I did not have a coping strategy or routine until about five years ago. And when my child was nine years old, and I was like, oh, okay, it's time for me here in in my early 40s to develop a coping strategy that I can use in difficult moments, I can model for him, but really, I needed it myself. And uh, it is I, I love what you're talking about. That's actually I have a chapter in differently wired that's called uh, recognizing how your energy affects your child. And that is such a piece of it is like uncovering our own like, why is this triggering us? I think it's important to go there. And you know, not just kind of surface level white knuckle parent, uh, a fake model, but actually go to that place and figure out what's going on here. So the energy around the way we're responding is genuine. Yes, yes, because they they know they can sniff out if you're genuine or not in an instant, which is so mm-hmm. frustrating sometimes, <laughs> but so, <laughs> but so great too. They're so perceptive, those different yes. wired kids. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I wanted to ask about in schools, um, cause this was something that we have the stuff happening at home. And then there are many differently wired kids who can keep it together in school you know, and who kind of unleash everything on their parents. And I know that that's really difficult. But then there are kids who can't, you know, who can't regulate at school. And when Asher was in school, I found I was doing a lot of, quote unquote, training, you know, trying to support teachers and understanding what was going on with his regulation, how to support him in regulating and in in difficult moments in certain situations. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we can best support teachers in being our partners in supporting our kids' uh, development of self-regulation? Yeah, you know, definitely something that that we're navigating right now with our own kids. And I think there has been a lot of progress. You know, I f- we're lucky to go. Um, we actually ended up switching schools from a private school to a public school um, so that we could get good social emotional learning and good supports and special education. Um, so we're fortunate that we go to a school that has been very receptive and very much ahead of the game. So more and more, you know, kids that come into my office are telling me, you know, when I'm bringing up something like emotional intelligence or whatever it might be, they're saying, oh, yeah, you know, I know that we learned that from from guidance, our guidance counselor. 
which I always do a little bit of a cartwheel over because it's so exciting that finally these things that research has indicated for years are so important, you know, are, are being incorporated in schools. And I know it's a long process, but, um, good to see those changes. So I think, yeah, I think partnering with, with schools and with the teachers and, you know, same, same kind of approaches with our kids, right? We don't want an adversarial energy. We want it to be, you know, assume that they have our kids' best interest in mind, assume that they're doing, you know, the teachers are doing um, the best they can with what they have, have to bring in Ross Green, as I know many of us are all uh, Ross Green groupies that are listening. So, <laughs> so yeah, assuming that, um, that, you know, they're doing the best they can and that they want to learn and that they're open to that and then trying to take a respectful stance with it. You know, I'm not sure if you've heard of this, but this has really helped us at home. That's one that I use a lot, you know, just this has really helped us because I want to help the teachers too, because the reality is, you know, I love being one-on-one -on -one with kids. It's amazing. But I've also tried to run small groups and try to run my daughter's Girl Scout meetings. And it is a different dynamic managing a classroom. So I try to empathize and think about, you know, what are, what's going on in the classroom that I might not understand and how can I kind of meet them halfway um, and having realistic expectations, but also, you know, expecting that they are going to meet my child's different needs, even though it will take more time and it will take more energy, but Hey, I'll help you with that. I'll meet you 80% of the way if you let me. And I'll, you know, I'll give you the information on what we see at home and what she responds best to at home and the resources that have been effective for us. And many of them that I brought in, you know, the guidance has said, you know, yep, we're, we're on top of it. And they have started to take this collaborative problem solving you know, trainings, they're starting with that. So I think it's slowly permeating into schools um, over here in the U.S. So that is a wonderful thing for sure. Yeah, that's exciting. So I'm wondering, you know, when I think of emotional and self-regulation, I definitely think about coping routines. You know, as I talked about earlier, that was something that we worked hard to develop here in our family and, and support Asher in developing his. Is that, is that part of the work that you do with families? And do you see that as a part of kind of in the moment regulation? Yeah. So, so really as far as, you know, parents most effectively supporting their child in learning these skills, there's a couple parts, a couple parts to the answer and the calming and calming tools and techniques is certainly um, a part of that puzzle. But overall, you know, thinking of it as we mentioned before, um, a co-regulation journey almost with the child. So because our child is not yet able to regulate their emotions and behaviors, we can step in as parents and take an active role in navigating the space with them um, or by, you know, co-regulating with them. And really, this is done in an environment where um, the child feels unconditionally safe and accepted which goes back to the the parent work that we uh, discussed earlier, you know, the really a grounded person that they can feel safe with in order to explore different calming strategies and tools with. Um, the idea is, you know, pretty counterintuitive because many of us are prone to moving away from our child when they are struggling. And I, and when we're reacting and when we're triggered, um, that is, you know, what the response that many of us have, but, when we do that work and we figure out what's going on internally with ourselves, um, you know, that then hopefully frees us up to be able to move toward them. So step one would be empowering um, the child with knowledge. So in my practice, I use the hand model from Dan Siegel, which I'm sure many parents are familiar with, which just does such a great job of breaking down the neuroscience of their emotions in a simple way by looking at, you know, the upstairs thinking brain, the downstairs emotional brain, and how our thinking brain goes offline when our emotions are running high. And because our differently wired kids will be more likely to flip their lid and it will be flipping more often, their thinking brains will be going offline more often, more frequently. Um, it's so important to normalize this for them as well as empower them to take action before you know, they get to this point. So I usually start by talking with kids about their anger warning signals or their emotions warning signals. So how do our emotions manifest in our body? Do your palms get sweaty? Do you notice your thoughts racing? Um, helping, you know, helping them notice the physiological signs 
of their emotions is a great concrete way to promote self-awareness and self-regulation. So the second part is kind of a three-part three-part answer. The second part I would say is laying the groundwork for emotional intelligence basics. So, you know, before we can get to the calming tools and techniques, we really need to have a strong framework for recognizing, understanding, and managing our emotions. So firstly, we need to make sure our child has a big emotion vocabulary because identifying emotions is the first step to working through them. So teaching kids that there are lots of different emotions and labels and giving them a wide emotional vocabulary allows them to take the first step really in working through them. And this teaching is best done like any teaching when um, when our child is calm and regulated, of course, um, but also is something that, you know, is good to be reminded of because I know we found ourselves trying to teach this stuff to our kids when they were super emotionally um, just not, not able to mid meltdown, right? Mid tantrum, not able to process and not able to remember. So definitely needs to be done consistently and optimally when the child is calm. So visuals is a fantastic way to do this, um, which is why I created a emotional intelligence bundle for parents um, that has emotions, flashcards, and some other visuals and guides to keep around the house. So you can kind of grab it and just do it in, you know, minutes here and there throughout the day um, and kind of do it all together as a family. And the next step after being able to identify the emotion is to guide them in expressing the feelings in a healthy, productive way. So again, the child will likely need the parents to be closely involved in helping to try out different methods of calming because every child's nervous system and sensory system is so unique. You know, as we talked about before, it's not going to be a straight path. It's realistic to expect a lot of trial and error and to expect that you know, these things change over time. Parents say all the time, you know, well, we, that doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work anymore. And, and I felt that too. And it certainly is frustrating. Um, and I just tell them, yep, you know, it's, it's part of the deal. Like you just got to roll with it and we move on to, to what's working right now for them. So it's definitely an evolving, an evolving thing. So looking at, you know, is there what spaces does your child respond to best? Um, do they seem to calm with physical touch or does it appear to agitate them? Do they prefer, you know, talking? Some kids like to verbalize. I don't know what that's like because my kids do not um, at all. And any sign of verbalization is going to be met with a not pleasant response. So, so for them, you know, noise is very overstimulating to them, which is pretty typical. So, you know, it's an ongoing journey and, having the expectation that it will take our differently wired kids a lot longer is only is really only going to help. We'll be right back after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. 
Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Lynn, this time of year, parenting can be such a fluster clux. You've come to the right place. I'm Lynn Lyons, and I've been treating anxious families for over 30 years. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law and co-host Robin Hudson. Join us for Fluster Clucks, a podcast for parents who worry. Wait, that's everybody. Yeah, these last few years have felt like one long anxiety attack for so many. Why do you think parents are always surprised that a podcast about anxiety relates to them, even if no one in their house has an anxiety disorder? Well, worry is human. Everyone does it. And anxiety shows up when we face uncertainty. All the parenting tips you've taught me have been essential. I love to break it down into skills we need to manage worry in our families. We've covered so many topics, depression, burnout, meltdowns, perfectionism. Don't forget scary mothers-in-law. Right, but of course that's not my mother-in-law. Because that's my mother. And a listener. As a psychotherapist, I like to teach parents and kids how to respond to everyday moments in healthy ways. Managing anxiety really can be taught. It really can. And I'll even tell you what to say. We talk about serious stuff, but without being too serious. Anxiety wants everything serious. Anxiety doesn't stand a chance when we're laughing, even about the tough stuff. You know, along the avenue of calming techniques, that takes us to the third part, which, you know, in itself is, can be a calming technique if that works um, for the child in the moment. Otherwise, as a consistent practice, mindfulness and breathing practice is just huge because, you know, our bodies and our minds are inextricably linked. So some very simple things parents can do to help give self-regulation a boost um, before we jump into mindfulness here along the same vein is to keep consistent routines, meals, bedtimes, just those simple things will help train um, a, a young child to self-regulate. And then, you know, the research on breathing and on mindfulness is just crazy on how it can really soothe and calm our nervous system. So I usually teach, you know, there's a lot of resources out there on how to take a good quality breath. I teach my kiddos, you know, how to, how a really impactful breath will engage, engage their whole body and sitting up and opening their diaphragm. And um, it's pretty cool to teach them the why behind it too. So to teach them, you know, when they breathe in, your diaphragm expands and it actually presses on a little nerve in your spine called the vagus nerve which sends calming signals to your nervous system and to your brain. So it's actually the quickest way physiologically to calm the system is to take a really good, a good breath and just incorporating different mindfulness practices into the day. I have an article um, on parents with confidence about simple, fun mindfulness practices. Um, there's so much research on mindfulness and the ability to regulate our emotions and behaviors by strengthening our front brain, that thinking brain. So, you know, really the power of mindfulness is how it can supercharge essentially our prefrontal cortex because it helps our kids to, by slowing down and turning inward, focusing on breath, focusing on sight, sounds, all of the senses and kind of grounding into that, even for a few seconds or a few minutes, helps them make a small shift from their emotion brain to their thinking brain, which is essentially, you know, kind of those neural pathways that we want to, we want to grease, mm -hmm. we want to get them used to being able to make that, those cognitive shifts. So, so yeah, mindfulness is just a small way to practice that consistently and help them to be able to tune, tune into their, their thinking brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of how it's my, my long answer on how I would how I would sum it up. <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you so much for laying all that out for us. And I want to be conscious of the time. So I have a couple of quick questions that I just want to ask. Sure. So one is I just want to ask what if kids are resistant to, for example, trying mindfulness or trying some of these strategies, you know, especially as kids get older, they may be less inclined to, you know, to try to do some of these things. They might think, no, I don't need to do that. Or, you know, do you have any language around that or ideas about that? Yes, for sure. Which is why I think my article on parents with confidence is something along the lines of mindfulness activities your kid will actually want to do. Um, mm. So 
yeah, you know, I think, I think one great way is, is outside support. So we've, we've confronted this ourselves, right? I mean, there's only so much and that our kids are going to hear from us. And then at, at some point, um, you know, there will be somebody else better to, better to fill that role and better to be, be the educator and kind of be a mentor in that way. So whether it's, you know, guidance at school or, you know, a counselor, a therapist, any, a social worker, whoever the support professional is that you can loop in. Um, that is a great way when kiddos are resistant to doing it at home. Otherwise, you know, they're kids. So, and they're curious, awesome, bright kids. So fun, you know, ways to make it. I, I sat down in the beginning and, you know, this is how, you know, with my inside the box methods, this is how we're going to learn about this today. And you're going to sit down and listen. And it's like, yeah, right. That did not last for more than five minutes. Right. (laughs) So, so finding creative ways to do it, fun ways. They of course like to be in control as we all do. Right. So letting them, you know, teach the skills, letting them read it. You know, there's so, there's, um, thankfully so many awesome resources out there now, you know, coloring pages and all sorts of different mindfulness things that kids can do on their own, um, that are, that are fun and just meeting them where they're at, I would say is, is the biggest thing, you know, what is your kid like? What are their interests? And just meeting them right there and trying to, to engage. So yeah, it takes, it definitely takes a little more energy and effort from us, but definitely from what we know, you know, on the research of self-regulation, um, and you know, the role that these skills will play ongoing throughout their lives, it's, definitely worth the investment in trying to, to figure out what vehicle best, you know, will will get these things across to them. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you said earlier that, you know, things will work and then they'll stop working. I mean, that's the case with, I think with parent of any child. And I just think for us between regressions and, you know, the way our kids change can feel really sudden and, completely throw us off track. So just knowing that change is part of what's going on. And then you just shift, you pivot and you try something else. And that's just part of it. Yes. So before we go, if you could just share where the best place is for people to connect with you. So I mean, you've mentioned some great resources, and I will make sure all the links are in the show notes page, but where can people find you? And is there any other amazing resource that people listening need to know about? Sure. Yes. So um, a couple other self-regulation resources, a framework that I use um, at that we use at home. Actually, we have an entire wall dedicated to it at home, um, as well as at work is the zones of regulation, um, which are used in a lot of schools too. But it's a really great self-regulation framework that just simplifies things into into concrete ways that kids can can process it much quicker so that they can kind of internalize it and just Instead of having to verbalize so much, um, they go with colors. So there's green zone, yellow zone, that type of thing. Um, so that is a great thing if people want to look that up. I want to mention that family board games are also a fantastic way to work on self-regulation. Turn-taking rules, inhibiting impulses, controlling emotions when you lose, you know, all of those types of things. So that's just a simple everyday way. And there's a great article on games to help boost self-regulation skills over at Inspired Treehouse um, as well that I like to pull from. Um, And then Breathe Kids is really a fantastic, it's my favorite app that I found and I've tried a lot of them and I recommend to to clients. Um, And we use it as well, just simple, probably for elementary age, probably, I don't know if, trying to think if like middle school age is pushing it a little bit, but um, fantastic way to incorporate, um, you know, fun and creativity with mindfulness and it's screen. So our kids think that's a win for them too, of course. Right. So those are some things for self-regulation. Um, as far as finding me, I am my website again, I'm Angela Proust and my website is parents with confidence. So people can find me on our Facebook page under parents with confidence. And I also recently, started a new Facebook page just for parents of differently wired kiddos called children's mental health rocks. So that will be me, um, leading the page and, you know, providing lots of resources from all different amazing voices and my writing from parents with confidence as well. So they can find me on either one of those Facebook pages. That's great. And thank you for sharing those resources. You're talking about games just reminded me of when playing connect as a family was, 
our homework for like six months just to practice losing (laughs) gracefully. Um, We've made a lot of progress in that, but uh, that was game night used to be my worst nightmare, I will just say. Yeah. And I still, when Asher's like, let's do a game night, I was still like, okay, okay. (laughs) Um, Anyway, um, but thank you again for those resources. Again, listeners, I'll share all of them in the show notes. So you can just go on the Tilt Parenting website and get access to all of that. And Angela, I know you've got to go pick up your kiddo. So I'm going to say goodbye. And um, thank you so much. This is such an insightful conversation. And I really appreciate you sharing it with us today. Oh, of course, Debbie. I am so honored to be on the podcast and love it so much. And I'm such a huge fan of your work. So thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, including links to Angela's website, Parents with Confidence, and all of the resources we discussed, and there were a lot of them in this episode, visit tiltparenting.com slash session 117. If you like what we're doing at the Tilt Parenting Podcast and you'd like to support us, there are a few easy and meaningful ways you can do this. One is to join my Patreon campaign. Patreon is an online platform that allows people to make a small monthly contribution to support the work of an artist or a musician, or in my case, a podcaster. It's super easy to sign up and even a small donation helps. The Patreon account is how I am paying for my editor, Donna, right now, and it is such a tremendous help. So thank you to all the Patreon supporters already participating in the campaign. If you would like to join those supporters, visit patreon.com slash tilt parenting. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash tilt parenting. You can also find a link on the tilt parenting website. The other way you can help is to head over to iTunes and leave a rating or a review or both if you haven't done so already. There are a lot of parenting podcasts out there and these ratings and reviews help keep our podcast highly visible, which in turn makes it easier for me when I send those emails to authors and other thought leaders asking them to guest on the show. So thank you so much. And thanks again for listening. For more information on Tilt Parenting, visit www.tiltparenting.com. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark-Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.